Welcome to another episode of Filter. On this show, we recognize that the world can be a confusing place to live in. And so what I seek to do on this show is to equip you to live with biblical clarity in our confusing world so that you can face the chaos of life with wisdom, integrity, and courage. My guest on today's episode is no stranger to this show. I'm excited to be welcoming back Oz Guinness. Oz Guinness has come back so that we can discuss his latest book called Zero Hour America. In this episode, I had the pleasure of talking about this new book with Oz, talking about the crisis of freedom and an understanding of freedom that we have here in the West and especially in America today, and what is the nature of freedom, what are the requirements for freedom to flourish, and so on. It's a great discussion, and I hope that you'll enjoy it as much as I did. Oz Guinness is the author and editor of more than 30 books, including The Dust of Death, The Call, Fool's Talk, and the Magna Carta of Humanity. A frequent speaker and prominent social critic, he has addressed audiences worldwide, from the British House of Commons to the U.S. Congress to the St. Petersburg Parliament. He is a senior fellow at the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics and was the founder of the Trinity Forum. Before we get into this episode, let me encourage you, if you have not yet already, to subscribe to our email list so that you, you can get all future episodes and content sent directly into your inbox as soon as they come out. Also, be sure that you're subscribed to Filter on whatever platform you get your podcasts so that you can get all future episodes right on your homepage whenever they come out. Lastly, if you've been helped by this episode or by any of our other episodes here on Filter, let me encourage you to please leave Filter a rating and review and to share this show with your friends. Leave Filter a five-star rating on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and also write a review on Apple Podcasts. Maybe you take these simple steps, it only takes a minute of your time but it greatly helps us to get the message of biblical clarity out to more people. Well, without any further delay, let's jump into this great conversation that I got to have with Oz Guinness. Oz, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. A pleasure to be on with you again. Yeah, well, it is a pleasure to have you back on again. I think this is your fourth episode with us here on Filter. And so uh, at some point, I'm going to have to start calling you a co-host. (laughs) <laughs> if you keep showing up this many times, <laughs> but you, uh, you keep writing great books. And so, uh, and so it is just, it, it, like I said, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you on every time and, uh, and to keep up with everything that you are writing right now. So many important topics that you're writing on important books that you're putting out for us that I'm really thankful for. We're having you back on today to talk about one of your latest, which is called zero hour America. In the beginning of uh, Zero Hour America, you talk about a moment of urgency that we are in related to a uh, crisis of freedom. So can you tell us about what is the motivation behind Zero Hour America and what is the urgency uh, that we are in that you're trying to address? Well, part of it is an impassioned plea to leaders to take the crisis seriously. So many don't get down to what is the depth of the crisis. So that's the first part of it. A second is to pick up the idea that uh, some people look at, but not enough, George Washington's idea of the importance of each person living under their own vine and fig tree, biblical idea, an incredibly important idea today over against globalism. But the third part of the book is a simple attempt to set out the seven foundational stones of what is freedom. Because a lot of people talk about it and won't rise much higher than cliches. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to write a Christian view of it that really sets it out simply. What are the seven things we have to take seriously about freedom? But the book overall, as you can see, is a passionate plea for people to take the crisis seriously. And so it's a crisis with our understanding of freedom. You write it how we misunderstand the character of freedom today and that it's different from what you call an understanding of freedom as ordered freedom uh, or ordered liberty. What's the difference between what you talk about or what you want to introduce to us in this book, uh, ordered liberty and the contemporary understanding of freedom in America and the West today? Well, Aaron, I'm sure I said this to you before, but almost everybody agrees on 
the great polarization. America as deeply divided as at any moment since just before the Civil War. But the differences come over why. You know, I have friends who say, it's a crisis of civility, or we've lost a sense of the common vision for the common good, or it's a matter of just the social media, or the coastals, New York, California, are over against the heartlanders, and the, the, the populists over against the globalists, things like this. Well, I think all of those have a part. Don't misunderstand me. But I'm passionately serious when I think the deepest division goes to the very heart of the republic, because the deepest division is between those who understand America from the perspective of the American Revolution, decisively shaped by the scriptures, and those who understand America from the perspective of ideas coming down from the French Revolution, shaped by the Enlightenment. So America couldn't survive, Lincoln said, half slave, half tree. And I would argue today, America cannot survive half 1776 and half 1789. So you think even a week ago, Monday of last week, a professor from the Harvard Law School and a professor from the Yale Law School said that the Constitution was broken and shouldn't be reclaimed. Now, that is really hmm. radical. If you abandon or destroy the Constitution, you destroy the heart of the Republic. But there's nobody at the highest level defending the Republic in the way that Lincoln did in his time. So part of the book is an impassioned plea to take seriously that fundamental divide, that great polarization. There's a lot of people today who would say, after you're listening to that, that the Constitution is this antiquated document written by men who are far removed from us in culture and time. And moreover, they were racist because they were slaveholders. And, you know, they really just wrote the Constitution to protect their slave owning power. Why can't we leave it behind? Why can't we do what we need to do today based on what we understand today? In other words, if someone objects and says, what's the point of protecting or preserving? Um, keeping the Constitution, what would you answer? You remember G.K. Chesterton, our great Christian apologist? He used to say, you should never destroy an institution or remove it until you understand what it was put in place and why in the first place. Now, the Constitution is the most ingenious ordering of freedom the world's ever seen, based, as I said, on Exodus and Deuteronomy and the Hebrew Torah. The trouble with progressivism, again, as G.K. Chesterton said, people say they're progressive, but without telling you the standard by which you can measure the progress. And one of the myths that's come along with progressivism is the simple idea the latest is greatest, the newer is truer, and therefore the past is irrelevant. And all that matters is the future, of course, as they see it. Now, that, of course, biblically, Christianly, Jewishly, is folly. We should remember the past. Now, of course, we're not only conservatives, we are conservative. We want to preserve the best that God has given us and the memory of what God has done for us in the past. We are natural conservatives. But not only that, we are true progressives. In other words, we know, you can see this in Scripture, we're not only looking towards the Messianic age when the Lord will do what we cannot do. We're striving in every generation to reach for ideals like freedom and justice and growth that we haven't done yet. So at the heart of a biblical view of freedom is the idea of change, growth, transformation. And because we can change ourselves in Christ, we can actually know we can also change the world. So Christians should be both conservatives in the best sense of the word, but not stick in the muds, not reactionaries, but also progressives, but be able to say what is the standard by which the progress should be judged. So we disagree with the progressivism in the secular sense that the past is totally irrelevant. That's absolute folly. Mm, yeah, I, I completely agree. Completely agree. Um, 
for uh, there might be those in our audience who don't know your background, but just by listening to you, they can guess that you're not born here in the state states. You're not a Yankee. Uh, how how long have you been living here in in the states? Well, I first came as a tourist in 1968, visitor, mm -hmm. and my wife and I came to live here in 1984, in the second Reagan era. You know, the slogan mm -hmm. of the time in that election was "Morning in America." And even back then in 84, I said, no, actually, it's not morning in America. It's late afternoon at best. And we're much closer to midnight for the Republic now. But as you know, I, I'm not American. I'm a great admirer of the American Republic and of the ingenuity of the way freedom was ordered here. But I'm not American. Yeah, and so as long as you've been um, observing and admiring America, and then now living here for a few decades, how have you? How has this topic of Americans' understanding of freedom changed over the years, or are we just kind of uh, maturing in this false view of freedom that we've had for quite a while now? In, in a sense, I think that your book, The Dust of Death, might have been. Uh, that uh, an observation of the early signs of what we're seeing come to fruition now. But in, just in other words, what have you seen in terms of the shift in American culture and understanding of freedom and a culture of freedom since you've been observing since the 60s? Well, I came in 68, as I said, and I've been looking at America earlier than that. I didn't know it at the time, but it was in 68. I came in the autumn, went from Harvard to Berkeley. I met Mario Savio, who led the free speech movement. A hundred American cities were ablaze that year after the assassination of Martin Luther King and of Senator Robert Kennedy. Now, in the autumn, two people called for what they termed a long march through the institutions. I didn't hear the call at the time. I read about it later. Mm -hmm. In other words, for all the riots and the radicalism, they wouldn't win in the streets. They had to do a long march around the central institutions and win the colleges and universities and so on. And you can see now, we're 50 odd years later, I've been following it for some time, they've done it. And the surprising thing this year, 2022, are the advances and the inroads into areas that would have been considered fortresses of conservatism, like, say, business or finance. And mm -hmm. above all, the military. Yeah. But now you've got the woke movement, woke business, woke finance, and increasing wokeism even in the military. In other words, the ideas coming down from the French Revolution have been incredibly successful in infiltrating many, many spheres of American society. Yeah, you pointed out uh, wokeism or the, the woke movement, which is currently in control of the Democratic Party and of the left in America. And so it's easy to point at them and, and point out the, um, the misunderstandings of, of freedom and the dangers that are there. But, you know, there's some people who say that conservatism, at least today in America, is just progressivism with going the speed limit. You know, in other words, they end up just embracing and becoming what progressives were 20 to 30 years ago. So do you think that, like I said, looking at the left, it would be easy to, uh, to, to point out all their, their faults in this area. But do you think looking at the right and looking at conservatives that they are much better in understanding the kind of freedom that you're writing about? Well, I would say the feature of the last 50 years has been a hollowing out of the center and especially of the old liberalism. And that was classical liberalism. I love it. It was concerned with freedom and concern with generosity, and that was wonderful. But under the impact of secularization and the impact of the radical left, you've seen a hollowing out of the center and of much of liberalism. You only need to take the trajectory of President Biden's career over 40 years. Mm -hmm. So much of the liberal uh, center of the past has been pulled towards the radical left. So you don't have a lot of the old liberals still left. And you have so-called liberals now who are illiberal. And you have classical liberals like, say, Alan Dershowitz, who's a civil libertarian, staunchly.
but deeply concerned against the illiberalism of many of his former liberal colleagues because they've been hollowed out and dragged towards the left by the radical left. Mm. Do you think that classical liberalism, which I've always, I've been a admirer and call myself uh, for a while now and call myself a classical liberal before, but do you think that, because uh, this is one thing I've been wondering about, do you think that it has been essentially doomed to go this direction from the start in that it attempted to have a neutral moral core by saying that, you know, we're not going to make Christianity the core or any other uh, uh, revealed religion, but rather, you know, reason. Um, well, you're making an incredibly good point. You you have to have a basis for whatever it is. You have mm-hmm. to have a basis. So, you know, I'm Irish in background. We have the great Edmund Burke. He's often seen as a conservative because he attacked the extremes of the French Revolution. But in his time, he was a Whig and he fought for justice. That's why he stood up for the American colonists over against the British government. Why he fought for reforms in the Indian Empire. He gave what is the longest speech, I believe, in British history. He spoke for 13 days in a row, (laughs) attacking the corrupt, oppressive governor general of India, Warren Hastings. So Mm -hmm. Burke was a Whig. You today call him a liberal. But he believed in freedom and justice as a Christian. But there was a basis back then, and today there's no basis. So liberalism without a basis will inevitably become illiberal. Yes, so do you think that it's possible for or it possible to have a society with the classical liberal values, uh, but with Christianity at the center of it sort of protecting and driving those values? Because I think what a lot of people would say is whenever you propose something like that, they'll say, well, now you're just wanting a theocracy. Well, that's a different discussion, Aaron. (laughs) You know, theocracy is the charge leveled against Exodus and Deuteronomy. That's unfair, because I think it was Josephus, Jewish, of course, who Mm -hmm. introduced the term theocracy. He was trying to explain to the Romans, who, of course, followed the Greeks, there were three forms of government, monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy, each of them with a corrupt form. But what was Israel? Well, it wasn't any of those three, precisely. So he called it a a theocracy. Most unfortunate, because theocracy has come to mean the rule of the clerics, usually highly oppressive religious leaders like, say, Iran today. Mm -hmm. Now, the Jews would say Exodus and Deuteronomy are not a theocracy. They are a nomocracy, the rule of law. Because if you look in Exodus, when the Lord puts out the covenant, and all that came, regulations and laws and so on, the covenant agreement, three times it says, all that the Lord says, we will do. Now, that's the origin of the consent of the governed. So Exodus is not a theocracy. Michael Walzer calls it an almost democracy. Hmm. It's not quite a modern sense of democracy or an Athenian sense, but it is an almost democracy. It's the rule of law. So we've got to unpack the great biblical foundations of freedom and justice because they're robust and they're realistic and they're lasting, whereas modern views of freedom aren't. So the center part of my book is on, you know, the seven foundations, and people Mm -hmm. have got to explore these things, and certainly those of us who are followers of Jesus, to know how to stand for them in public. They are the highest views of freedom the Jewish and Christian views, the world has ever seen. And I personally think they are the way forward for humanity in the future, which means we've got to get so many of our fellow Christians off the back foot. We needn't be defensive. We have the best views of freedom and justice the world's ever seen, and the key to going forward. If only we will explore and rediscover these things. So going back to the urgency of the hour, if America continues to move away from 
what was the vision of uh, what our political system should be and what uh, and, and the kind of ordered liberty that we should live by uh, at the founding. If we continue to move away from that, what are we moving towards in America today? In other words, what would be the destination of this road that we're going down? Well, I put it simply in the book, there are three choices at the moment. Revolution, oligarchy, or homecoming. Revolution is the victory of the radical left. That is the end of the republic. Now, the republic could end, and you still got something of a democracy. Eventually, that will go too. But that's the first option, revolution. And I would say, please, God, no. The second one, oligarchy. Many people don't notice. We haven't really got a democracy. We've got a growing chasm between the elites and ordinary people. Take, say, Hillary's famous description of the deplorables, or the way that President Trump is able to give voice to the so-called forgotten people. Now, I'm not attacking Hillary or defending Trump, but what they're playing on is the emerging chasm between the elites and ordinary people. That is extremely dangerous. It's certainly not only the end of the republic, eventually the end of the democracy. What's the third one? Homecoming. We all know as Christians the meaning of metanoia, repentance, a radical about turn of heart and mind and spirit. Many Christians who know that don't know the meaning of the Hebrew for the same word, teshuva. Now, teshuva adds one thing more. You not only have an about turn of heart and mind and spirit, teshuva means homecoming. When you turn from the wrong to the good, from the false to the true, you're turning from all the rottenness of unbelief back to the Lord, like the prodigal coming home. And the word repentance in Hebrew has the element of homecoming. I'd never heard that word till I came to America, the idea you go back to your alma maters in the fall and so on. But Mm -hmm. the biblical idea is far deeper. Can America come home? to its first principles. I pray and hope so. But we've got to have people today who will clarify the choice. We're in a kind of Joshua moment. Choose today who you'll serve. Go one way or the other. 1789 or 1776. Now, of course, 1776, as you know well, wasn't perfect. The retention of slavery and other things do. Mm-hmm. So there's got to be a confession and a redressing and an atonement for those genuine evils, but they're not in the scriptures. They were wrong by biblical standards. So I still think we need to go rediscover and re explore and call people back to the best first principles of the American experiment. I think, as you mentioned, we're we're already in an oligarchy where mm-hmm. we still have the appearance and many of the uh, at least bureaucratic functions of a democratic republic. But in reality, America is really more of an oligarchy today run by elites um, or as it's commonly called in uh, you know, the deep state. And I, I think there's, there, there, there's some negative connotations put towards that, but in, 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 in conspiratorial thinking. But in reality, there is, you know, what it is referring to is this gigantic bureaucratic system that runs without accountability, that runs uh, by uh, w- without election and consent of the people. And so I think we already do have a, an oligarchy running much of America today. And so if we're already in an oligarchy now, how do we move from oligarchy to homecoming? Well, we've got to remind people what genuine democracy. Now, of course, the framers were wary of democracy and above all, popular democracy, but that's what the left wants. So take democracy. If you ask the average American, what is the definition of democracy? You'll almost always get Lincoln's government of the people, by the people, for the people. You remember the last lines of the Gettysburg Address. Mm -hmm. Many people forget, Christians need to remind them, Lincoln was quoting. That wasn't original. He was quoting a pastor in Boston who'd spoken on that a few months earlier. But more Mm -hmm. importantly, the pastor was quoting. And you know who he was quoting? He was quoting John Wycliffe, Mm -hmm. the reformer, the morning star of the Reformation. 
And what Wycliffe was saying, you know, in his time in the 14th century, only the priests, the church elite, had the scriptures. Ordinary people didn't have the scriptures. So you needed a translation of the scripture in English in the hands of everybody. It didn't happen until later under William Tyndale and, of course, the Reformation. But Wycliffe said, if you have the Bible in the hands of everybody, then it makes possible self-government. They will have the principles knowing how to live freely and justly that makes self-government possible. And you will have government of the people, by the people, for the people. So we should be, I think, defenders of the republic. That's the more urgent thing. But when it comes down to democracy, we should warn them, as you've just done, of oligarchy. But we need to shore up the very meaning of democracy. You can't have it in modern terms. Mm. There's this image that you refer to very frequently in the book, and you you devote this uh, short, a brief, a really good chapter to it in, in the first part. The image that Washington frequently refer to as living under your own vine and fig tree. Is, is that right? Vine and fig? Yes. yes. Uh, living under your own vine and fig tree. And it was this vision that he had, that he had for what freedom in America would look like. Can you explain that image that he referred to, the background for it, and what it means uh, practically in life? Well, I love it. Washington obviously loved it. He quoted it 49 times in his writing, the most famous being to the Jews in Newport, Rhode Island, where he hoped that they would live freely under their own vine and fig tree. I love it because Washington is not thought of as the great thinker, Jefferson, Madison, Hamilton, but not Washington. But he loved that. And of course, it comes from the scripture. Now, in scripture, if we look at it in the prophets and in uh, Chronicles, it is partly messianic. In other words, people will have a local peace and freedom, living contentedly under their own vine and fig tree when the Messiah comes. But there's also that great reference that at the time of Solomon, there was such peace and such prosperity that it's said that everyone lived under their own vine and fig tree. In other words, it's a vision of local peace, contentment, and freedom. Now, that's important today. You think of the French uh, Front Porch Republic, people who follow Wendell Berry and so on. They're trying to recapture the local, not only over against the national, but over against the global. Because whatever's the most powerful unit of your thinking used to be the nation as opposed to the local neighborhood. That tends to dominate. So the old town hall meeting was swallowed up by the Congress. You know, the original meaning of federal comes from the Latin for covenant, Mm fides. It meant a covenantal agreement between the local and the national, the states and the government and so on. But it came to mean the feds are the people coming from Washington. And now the whole swing is the nation is under threat from the globalists, George Soros in his style. And I think the idea of Washington's living under your own vine and fig tree. The Catholics call it subsidiarity. In other words, never going higher and more centralized than you need to. So you keep alive personal local freedom. Washington's idea is incredibly interesting and worth exploring today. And once again, Christians should be interested in that, not because we're followers of Wendell Berry or the Front Porch Republic, but because the idea is actually biblical. In what ways? Well, in the sense that it's there in the messianic vision, and it's Mm -hmm. there. That idea of freedom must start with the individual and the family. Mm. The whole of biblical faith is a family-oriented faith. Now, the family isn't a nuclear couple. It's a, a, a miniature clan. But the family is the heart of faith in Israel. And you can see how important that was when they were smashed by the Romans in AD 70 and 133. It was the synagogue rather than the temple and the family that was the heart 
that kept the survival of Judaism alive despite intense persecution and intense scattering all over the world. So those notions are incredibly important, and we've got to understand a biblical view of the family. So, for example, Aaron, if any project, I may have said this to you in a previous time, if any project takes more than a single generation, you need families, you need schools, and you need history. Mm. Now, faith obviously needs to go on. And without families and schools and history, it'll founder. Generation Z is appallingly illiterate in terms of the faith. Family breakdown, the crisis of education in churches and others, we've got a generation who doesn't know the gospel. And the same is true of American freedom. Obviously, our primary concern is the gospel, not freedom. It's faith rather than freedom. But both of them require families and schools and history if there is to be a transmission, a handing on from generation to generation. Wow. And whenever you say that, I think what are three of the main areas that uh, the left and, as you put before, wokeism has moved and made its influence in our culture and certainly it'll be in the family and destroying the the christian understanding of the family it'll be in education by inserting uh Mm -hmm. marxist ideas into public education uh, at every grade level and certainly in universities for a while and in making people either historically ignorant or just trying to rewrite history with things such as the 1619 project um, or, you know, I, I remember whenever I was 16 years old and going through driver's ed, the guy, and I can't remember the context, but the guy asked the question, when was America founded? <laughs> and I thought, well, th- that's an easy question, but no one in the room knew. Oh. I, was, I was in a room of maybe 40 other, you know, teenagers, young adults, no one knew. Wow. Yeah, no one knew. Mm-hmm. I, I, I saw a video today of a guy who was on a... Uh, I don't know, he was on some university campus and he was uh, asking people about who was Joseph Stalin and who was Mao. And none of them knew. Mm. But they can name all three of the Kardashians. Oh. <laughs> well, there you go. And that's disastrous, absolutely disastrous. Now, as followers of Jesus, we should have been forewarned. Mm. I often point out that the sexual revolution, which is taken as very different from the political revolution, actually goes back to the same place in Paris, the Palais Royal, as the political revolution. And if you read the architects, for example, in the 1920s, one of the great ones was Wilhelm Reich, a little book called The Sexual Revolution. He gave us the term. He's quite open. They want to subvert thousands of years of civilization, above all the Jewish and Christian. But then he says, we've got two enemies we have to overcome. One, the family, the patriarchal family, and two, the church. So the sexual revolution, which is a kind of form of sex Marxism at its most radical, is out to subvert the family and the church. And they're quite clear about that's why they suggest sex education and they push for it three and four, because you're sidelining parents. Now, they wrote these things a hundred years ago. Why Mm -hmm. weren't we forewarned and standing against it for the family in general and against some of the wickedness and perversion of sex education at that sort of age when they're essentially grooming and so on? But we should have been forewarned. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you write about in Zero Hour America whenever in regards to the character of freedom is that, and I thought this was an interesting, interesting statement is that one of the greatest, wow. One of the greatest dangers to freedom is freedom. Can you help us understand that? Well, it's a simple historical fact that free society is really lost. And why? Well, there are various reasons why freedom is the greatest danger to freedom, but the basic one is freedom just runs to seed. In other words, freedom requires truth. Freedom requires character. Freedom requires a way of life. 
but freedom undermines all those things when it runs to seed. So our Lord says, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. But you think today, postmodernism says there is no truth. Mm. Or you take the fact, Isaiah Berlin pointed out, freedom is both negative, freedom from, and positive, freedom for. But modern people take libertarians. They like the negative. I'm free from. Just do what you like. If you're free from, don't tread on me and all that sort of stuff. So modern freedom majors on the negative freedom, forgets the positive freedom. But freedom is not just liberation. That's the negative. It's liberty, living free, which is what the Bible's all about. But we forget that. So there are all sorts of reasons why people get excited with freedom and forget what freedom really is and what it takes to survive. As Lord Acton says, freedom is not the permission to do what you like. It's the power to do what you should. Mm. And I think that even if Christianity is not the core uh, worldview in, in a culture, there will be another worldview or, uh, or philosophy, religion, that will tell people what they ought to do. Because I think it would be easy to look at our culture and call it a purely libertine culture that only believes in the negative form of freedom. However, once again, going back to wokeism, uh, there is a worldview which is telling people what they ought to live for, and it ought to be one of self-expression uh, and so on. So if Christianity isn't at the core, where do you think people will turn to look for what their life should be driven by and defined by? Well, you know, the great post-war theologian Reinhold Niebuhr used to put it, we've got to see that history has two bookends at each extreme. One is anarchy, all freedom, no order. And that's unlivable, it takes you to chaos. The other extreme is authoritarianism, all order, no freedom. Now, in fact, the two extremes encourage each other. So if you live totally freely, doing what you, you, you produce society down to chaos. And there, there are parts of America that are like that today. But the more unlivable they are, the more people will stress order and out of the chaos produce coercion and control. Hmm. So people will swing from one extreme to the other, and that's bound to happen. So you can see that a lot of the radical left talks liberty, but only as a means of victimizing, I'm sorry, of weaponizing the victims. But then at the end of the day, they're not interested in real diversity, they're interested in uniformity and they end in tyranny of one sort or another. So again, we, we should look at their views of freedom and strip them down and point out where they lead people, because they're leading towards authoritarianism. It's ironic that America, the land of the free, will soon become more and more authoritarian. Can you give them some specific examples of where you see America moving authoritarian? Well, take our three basic political rights, freedom of conscience and religion, freedom of speech, and freedom of assembly or association. You know, those have been fundamental for 300 odd years. I mean, religious freedom was considered the first liberty. But now in the last 20 years since RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, there's been a greater sea change in understanding those three freedoms than in 300 previous years. So religious freedom, oh, it's a code word for bigotry and discrimination. So squelch it in the name of what they call justice. And the same is true. You can see how the cancel culture uh, cancels out people's freedom of speech and so on. So the foundational freedoms are sincerely, are severely under threat today. Mm. It's interesting. Yeah, I think one of the things that's happened is, because like I said before, we still have at least the, uh, if even if they are empty, the structures and institutions of a democratic republic. Uh, and yet we see these authoritarian movements happening all around our culture. And more often than not, I think how it's being accomplished is by uh, is by the by leftist political actors weaponizing 
cultural institutions to accomplish their authoritarian ends, right? So it's not necessarily uh, a president or governor or senator who is canceling someone, but they are weaponizing Twitter to cancel someone or a corporation to fire and silence a viewpoint and so on. It's it's interesting how this has happened. I think that uh, if I remember right, that's what Rod Dreher was uh, calling the pink police state in Live Not By Lies. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. And, you know, in the last few weeks, we've seen the weaponizing of the FBI and the man who resigned this week because he was so openly against President Trump. Now, you don't have to be in favor of President Trump to see something really dangerous in what happened there. Mm-hmm. Or uh, my own bank, which I won't mention by name because things are going on now. There was a Christian nonprofit on a Monday morning, woke up, their credit cards and everything were canceled. They weren't told it was going to happen, but it was their views on same-sex marriage, and they were quietly canceled. A very Mm. powerful American bank. Uh, And so on. We've got to look at this. The advances and the inroads of wokeism in all sorts of areas needs to be checked. The land of the free no longer is. Mm. I think one thing that we need in order to regain a a stronger and more robust sense of freedom and of positive freedom and of ordered liberty, like you've written about, is a uh, renewing of the sense of responsibility that comes with this freedom. I love one of the the, uh, phrases that I go back to very often from Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, one of my all-time favorite books, is whenever he mentioned that America has a statue of liberty on the East Coast but we need to build a statue of responsibility on the West Coast because in order to have ongoing and sustainable freedom, you need responsibility. And this is one of the points that you argue as well. What is one? Of, what is the importance and the relationship between freedom and responsibility? Of course, if someone has genuine freedom, they're responsible for the choices and the consequences of their freedom. Now, biblically, you could think of that in a lot of areas. So, for example, Take, say, responsibility and leadership. In the scriptures, a leader is not necessarily the person at the top or out in front. It's the person who is responsible for the situation right in front of them. It might be an opportunity. It might be a crisis. Something needs addressing. They take responsibility, initiative. So in the Old Testament, the greatest leader is clearly Moses. But the Jews have a hero I'd never heard of. He's not in the scriptures, but I love the idea. Have you ever heard of Nashon? No. Well, at the Red Sea, here are the Egyptians closing in on the Israelites, panicking. And Moses raises his rod, and the Lord sends a wind that drives back the waters, and they have a path through the waters. But Moses holds up his rod, but the people all look at it. After you, Claude. Nashon was the man in tradition, the Jews say, he said, come on, let's go. And he strides out into the Red Sea, and the waters hold back, and everyone dares follow him. Mm. Or you think of a real example, Phineas, who when immorality was spreading, he took his spear and he did something. And the Lord is proud of him and commends him. And so leadership is people who take responsibility. So we think today we can't wait till a president does it or a Lincoln is born. No, no. Everyone in every sphere in which we live, at whatever level we live, we are responsible as free people for the situation in front of us. It might be a good Samaritan has to do something about the beaten up man. All right. That's responsibility in terms of compassion. It might be Phineas, who's angry and outraged at the promiscuity. It might be Nashon, who strides into the Red Sea. But that's responsibility. We are free. Responsibility is not a higher virtue that you add later if you want to. No, no. Responsibility is part and parcel of freedom. Because we're free, we make choices. We say I, we, and do things. There are consequences, and we're responsible for them. Now, the negative, this is important, Aaron. In the biblical view, the negative is people use their freedom to sin, and then they're not responsible. 
Think of Adam. The woman you gave me, she gave me the fruit. Or Cain, am I my brother's keeper? In other words, sin always exonerates itself by blaming someone else. It sloughs off the responsibility. So biblically, freedom and responsibility are one. And we need to recover that in the church today and in citizenship today. Mm. The relationship between freedom and responsibility, as you laid it out, makes me think of the relationship between salvation by grace, but then a life of obedience. Yeah. And I think that one thing that I've found whenever I've, um, I, I realized it several years ago in my own church, and then now as I've, whenever I travel and speak somewhere else, is that we, with few exceptions, have Christians today who understand grace pretty well, but then struggle to understand how to reconcile that with the call to taking up your cross, responsibility, and obedience. And so it's interesting, this parallel that we have in the church between a grasping onto and understanding a celebration of grace, which is wonderful. <laughs> Amen. Mm -hmm. And then in the culture, a celebration of freedom uh, without the responsibility paralleling the church, but without the, the obedience and sanctification. Oh, you put it well. And I, I followed Jesus for 60 years now. And I came to faith through people. I didn't come to faith specifically through him, but I came to know him afterwards. People like John Stott. And mm. in those days, they put it very simply. We are saved by faith and grace alone. By not by faith that is alone. Now, as once we come to trust the Lord, then we obey, we count the cost, we do what takes it needs to be done in our callings, and so on. And we've got to keep all these things together. So it's not by works. It's by grace and by faith, but mm -hmm. they're not left alone by themselves. Yeah. Yeah. I just think the, the parallel is interesting that, that they happen at the same time in American culture. I wonder if it's because as our culture was moving more and more towards this libertine, unordered understanding of freedom, churches in an effort to try to reach people who were being drawn more by the culture were saying, well, look at what we're offering, it just makes you more free. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud there. Well, you know, my own reading of the scriptures this morning, I was reading early chapters of Deuteronomy. When you enter the land and you have buildings that you didn't build and prosperity that didn't come from you and so on, don't forget. And there's no question that American power and prosperity and peace after World War II, when America was unrivaled in much of the world, and then after 1989, when the Soviet Union fell, and America was totally unrivaled for a brief time. You know, many Christians went to sleep, and they forgot we're called to be a counterculture. The first word to Abraham, the father of the faithful, leave. Break with your country your culture, your kin. And that countercultural call has become very important today because to the extent that we've become equated with America, we've become worldly and weak. Hmm. And we've got to be faithful to the Lord and break with everything that's not his way and recapture the power of the gospel in tension with the world. Hmm. We're coming close to the end of our time here. And so before we go, I want to ask you just one last question, which is, in light of what you've written and observed, you described earlier in your book as uh, your your project here was a uh, a oh goodness my my mind went blank um, a Paul Revere moment, you know, calling out to uh, Americans of the the danger and urgency of the moment. Is there anything that you look at in American culture today or in the West? Any movements or uh, or, or leaders that give you hope for the future? Well, always in a crisis like ours, the generalizations tend to be a little discouraging. And the encouragement comes from the exceptions. So thank the Lord for every exception. Mm. Whether we're talking about human trafficking and the Christian movements like IJM that have arisen, or the canceling of religious freedom and great groups like ADF have arisen, and so on. Thank God for all the exceptions. But this is a day when we need leadership at every level. 
and we need every follower of Christ. It, it concerns me. I cross the country and I meet people who say, you know, I keep my head down. I'm faithful. And my model is the early church. They couldn't do anything. I can't. It's the wrong model. The early church couldn't do anything because they were under an imperial dictatorship. We're not. We're in a republic partly and decisively modeled on the Torah, Exodus. And in the Exodus, every Jew was responsible for every Jew, and every Jew was responsible for the covenant. And in that sense, every American is responsible for the American Republic. And for Americans not to be engaged is not only a failure of discipleship, our call to be salt and light, it's a failure of citizenship. So shame on those Christians who are just keeping their heads down and saying that they're faithful. I'll finish with this, Aaron. If you look at the grand crises of history, often at the end of them, two questions are raised. One, what happened? And two, why didn't someone do something when they could have done? Now, we can read history like that and say to ourselves, now is the time to ask, not what happened, but what's happening? And why aren't people doing what needs to be done while there is still a moment in which it makes a difference? And so I would call people out of a matter of discipleship and faithfulness as salt and light, but also as citizens, those of you who are Americans, to play your part at this incredible moment. Well, that's a great place to finish. Oz, I just want to thank you so much for joining us today again on Filter and for the work that you're doing, as I've been greatly benefited from it and uh, enjoy getting to read your books and enjoy these conversations that you have with us. And I know the audience has enjoyed it and gotten a lot out of it as well. So thanks a lot. Once again, we talked about Zero Hour America today. I'll have it linked in the show notes for any of you guys who are listening and want to get the book. Just click on the link in the show notes and you can get it there. So you can get yourself a copy get some for friends and family, maybe get a group together and read about it and figure out how you can uh, take up your responsibility. It comes with your freedom uh, as we are all called to do as a part of our discipleship. So once again, Oz, just thank you so much for joining us today on Filter. Thank you. Great privilege to be with you again. Thanks for listening. I hope this episode provided you with biblical clarity to live with confidence in our confusing world. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. To catch up the latest from me, you can go to my website, aaronchamp.com. While you're there, subscribe to my newsletter so that you can be updated anytime I share new content. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Aaron M. Champ. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time. Until then, hold fast to the